All right. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Eric Dushek. I'm head of Middle East and North Africa at the World Economic Forum. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this uh, closing session. Um, we've had a great two days of uh, deliberations, and um, I'm joined by a really distinguished panel of people that I believe really reflect the richness of the different deliberations that uh, we've seen here um, over the past two days. Let me just recap for you uh, what was at stake here. Uh, we were uh, gathered here under the theme uh, building new platforms uh, of cooperation. What did we mean by that? What do we mean by that? Well, um, as you know, we uh, have been working the World Economic Forum uh, on the region, in the region, with the region since the 70s. And we have multiple points throughout the year where we consult with different stakeholders uh, in the region. And the picture that has been emerging um, over the past few years is really a picture of a region of two systems. Um, one that is forward-looking, um, that has the demographic majority of young people that are the, under the age of 30, technology natives. Uh, it, it's got great companies, uh, globally competitive multinationals. Uh, it's got very forward-leaning governments uh, that are uh, open economies, uh, experimenting with new uh, um, policies uh, uh, that are quite impressive. On the other hand, the other system is the, the legacy system, uh, bloated public sector, um, arguably sclerotic institutions not fit for purpose, and obviously conflict and fragility. Um, and so the picture is two systems, forward-looking legacy, and how do we make sure that we enable the forward-looking system to achieve velocity? And how do we make sure that it is not held back by the gravitational, very strong gravitational forces of the legacy system? The fact is that most of the people, most of us, we live in a mixed reality. So even if you live in a, you can have a one day in a very forward-looking system, but then you go to the post office or you go back to where you are originally from, and, and you encounter the legacy system. So uh, building new platforms of cooperation is really about how do we provide space for people to think through the future of the economic and social model? How do we think through um, environment? How, we do, how do we think through uh, having really effective mechanisms to work on humanitarian emergencies uh, in this region in a multi-stakeholder way? Um, given, um, given the tension and the architecture of the two systems. So this is just a recap of what, uh, what, we, what was at stake, what was at the heart uh, of this summit. The other thing I wanted to, uh, at the beginning, just to mention, this was of course a space, two days of dialogue and deliberations, uh, but what does it lead to? It's very, very important that there are outcomes, that it leads to something that uh, we can all be proud of. And so, uh, of course, there may be many results that I have missed, but I've attempted to, uh, with uh, my colleagues, to look at some of the outcomes that we've seen, uh, nascent outcomes that may be important. First, uh, Jordan. Um, we see uh, a huge gap uh, overall, uh, fractures in global cooperation and dialogue. Well, Jordan just reaffirmed, again, uh, that it is a convener of global community, not only regional, but uh, of uh, global community. You know that among the 100 startups that we announced here, 27 were from Jordan. Uh, a huge testament to the innovation and entrepreneurial uh, capability um, of this nation. We also had a, uh, a Shape Mina, the gathering of the uh, outstanding leaders under the age of 30, uh, was here in Jordan. Uh, so uh, really a big, a big thing uh, for Jordan reaffirming its role in the region. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to mention to you is uh, uh, around, uh, around the startup ecosystem. So uh, we, have, um, we have, and we'll talk about it with Alain, uh, we have identified a gap. Uh, it's, it's about how do you scale impact of these startups. And there was a specific outcome out of the um, uh, startup program, the United Arab Emirates, uh, came forward and said that all the 100 startups that were selected by the World Economic Forum uh, will be uh, will have access to long-term visas to come to the United Arab Emirates. Uh, a really, really important uh, step. The other gap that was identified by many of you is this gap about uh, people that live that are refugees, young people. Uh, that uh, may be the lost generation. They're, they may be unemployable uh, in the future because of the uh, situation they find themselves in right now. And you may not know, but there was a big announcement here. Um, the University of the People announced uh, tuition-free accredited online university in Arabic, specifically targeted um, at uh, the vulnerable populations uh, in this region. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, another outcome, very important. Uh, I don't know if you knew, but uh, many people are skeptical about, um, uh, about the geopolitical outlook or the fragilities that we say 85% of respondents to our global risk report are saying that they think uh, geopolitical confrontations in this region and globally will increase this year. Well, what we did here, we had uh, two young people one from West Jerusalem, one from East Jerusalem, stepping forward in a press conference and saying that they are establishing two hubs of global shapers, East and West Jerusalem, in this political climate. And they're establishing them and they're saying they're going to um, uh, work together. They want to, uh, they want to uh, make uh, the voice of their generation be heard in building peaceful and equitable societies. Very, very important. The other thing I wanted to mention, I could go on, but I, I wanted to just uh, mention another thing. Uh, uh, global, our global risk report identified quite an important blind spot for the region. Um, uh, and the, this blind spot is environmental stewardship uh, because some could argue, okay, we in certain societies, there is so much to focus on in terms of the uh, social issues, in terms of unemployment, uh, environmental stewardship, second, third order. Well, it's changing, and particularly the young generation, the shapers that are here, um, they put that quite high on their agenda. And there was one specific outcome I wanted to mention when uh, the uh, UAE Minister for Climate Change and Environment made a big announcement in, in supporting the uh, initiative that the World Economic Forum has around circular economy and they will focus in that effort on the region specifically um, and how particularly the technology, the fourth industrial uh, revolution uh, can, uh, can contribute. So there are many other, uh, many other outcomes that are on this list that I could enumerate, but um, I think some of them will also uh, come out uh, of this conversation. So let me turn uh, to uh, my colleagues here uh, on the panel. Uh, first, let me introduce them. We have uh, with us Rania Al Mashad, Minister of Tourism of Egypt and uh, Young Global Leader. So, Rania, welcome. Alam Bejani, to my left, Chief Executive Officer of Majid Al Futaim Holding in the UAE. Uh, Noor Al Gariba, uh, Design Strategy and Brand Development Officer of Syntax in Jordan and a Global Shaper. We have Bob Roberts. Founding and senior pastor a Northward Church, and Adel Buselli, who is the chief executive officer of Amal Glass and one of the 100 startups that we've awarded here um, at the Dead Sea. Uh, Alain, let me uh, start with you. Um, you are also a co chair of this summit. Um, you talk a lot about markets and scale. Uh, you talk about frictionless trade in the region. So how do we, how do we get there? 
Um, we, t uh, we, we, uh, we, for example, in our private proceedings, we talked about Karim, three billion acquired, same amount of customers have left, went public for 23 billion. Scale, scale, scale. So how do we achieve more scale uh, in the Arab world for uh, the next generation of companies to, to, to achieve uh, the heights of lift? To lift up. Yes, we need to lift up the, the region, that's for sure. Well, thank you, Mirek, and thank you again for the opportunity to co-chair uh, this, uh, this MENA summit. I think I came, I came to, to the Dead Sea with, with a number of ideas, and one of them was how can, we, how can we use this opportunity to create new platforms for cooperation in order actually to do something that's badly needed for the region, which is find a new economic model that can, that can integrate this region and allow it to punch above its weight, rather, sorry, to actually punch, punch at its weight, where today we're punching below our weight. We, we live in a region that has 600 million people, but actually the, we produce less than a small country of five or six million people elsewhere in the world. In order to do that, we need to engage into more cooperation. We need to talk together. We need to actually work together. And we need the private sector that actually nets this region together to come forward with an economic vision. And this is something that never happened in the past, an economic vision that's constructive and that can actually double or triple the GDP of the region. So I came with these ideas and, and every conversation we had, in a way, reaffirmed my beliefs in the, in the necessity of these new platforms for cooperation and in the fact that uh, this is badly needed. Whether we talk about data flows, whether we talk about the 4IR and how are we going to benefit or how we're going to make sure that this region does not miss its fourth industrial revolution and so on and so forth, we see that this is extremely important. Uh, this is one takeaway for me, and we see that most of the technological related issues are limited in this region because of, I would say, old world, old world issues. On the other side, I gave an example that actually in the same week when Karim was acquired by, by Uber, which actually is a very important milestone for the region because it, it, it's a testimony of the importance of this test testament to the, of the importance growing importance of the region globally after Amazon having acquired Souk, you see that a similar transactions in a way have happens in the US with a company that has almost the same amounts of rights that Karim has that actually goes IPOs for $24 billion, while Karim is sold for $3.1 billion. So in a way, and I would say very anecdotally, this is the discount of the region. So if you have the same business that is sold for 20, is valued at $24 billion, in the US and only 3.1 in the region, the, this, the region discount is something around $20 billion. And this is one of the first time where actually we see the, how much it's costing us to do business in this region. Now what does that mean? Should we abandon and, and, and jump ship? No. What we should do is double down on actually bringing this region up because we have so much, so much uh, at stake and also we have so much opportunities and room for development. We have a region that has the right social demographics. More than 50% of our population is less than 25 years old. We have a region that's actually extremely engaged with very high internet penetration and mobile penetration. We have extremely good talent. But what we need to do is come together and work on netting this region together to create, to make sure that the total is greater than the sum of the parts. And I think the conversation that you had here were fantastically, were fantastic, greatly important, and I already see a number of actions that uh, have been taken and will be taken after these conversations. So, great opportunity to co-chair. Love the fact that we have a number of practical outcomes that happen. The UE reacting immediately and say, "Look, you guys, you're a great talent. The UE is open for business. We're here to support you, and we are going to basically lend you." our platforms in order for you to grow. And at the same time, having the 4IR center in Dubai, I think that will be inaugurated somewhere, somewhere in, the, in the coming weeks. And a new work stream there on circular economy that is extremely important, also taking shape, is very encouraging and we're looking forward to do more. Thank you. And I'll still come back with some other questions, but uh, moving to uh, Rania Mashat. Rania, I've known you for number of years. You are now Minister of Tourism for Egypt, but you're also vice, you were vice governor of the Central Bank of Egypt uh, 
Um, also, you were at the IMF in the meantime. Uh, and I, I know how, uh, how important always for you has been uh, and how, how much thinking you've done around the role of women in, in uh, society and a role of women in the economy. So if this has been a big thing for us here, um, that we had a specific session on that. We had a um, new report that one of our partners launched here looking at, uh, looking at that opportunity. What does it mean for Egypt specifically? I'll be very interested. I know you're reforming the tourism sector, but overall, what does it mean for Egypt, the opportunity of even more inclusion of women in society and in the economy? Uh, thank you very much, Merrick. I'm also very glad that I'm a co-chair during this event uh, with Alan and, and other colleagues. Um, before I talk about women, there's something that you said which is quite uh, fascinating, this idea of forward-lookingness and legacy. And maybe one of the uh, sectors which is very well known for the region, tourism, you have a lot of legacy, but at the same time, we want to reform, so we put the forward-lookingness with it. We try to employ uh, the um, uh, new norms of doing business, digitalization, women empowerment, green tourism, sustainability. So you try and weave in uh, the, the future and what we see currently with a lot of the history that exists not just in Egypt but in, uh, in different regions. Just something on, uh, on tourism, particularly today when we are discussing uh, the rise in, uh, in the concepts of nationalism and protectionism, uh, one of the sectors that actually encourages everyone uh, to uh, know each other, be close to each other, connect with one another, uh, spreading ideas of cooperation is tourism. Mm. People are able to travel from one place to the other, know different cultures, so it's one way to actually overcome a lot of the, um, uh, the unfortunate rise in some of the rhetoric uh, around protectionism and, and nationalism. What we are doing in, uh, in Egypt, uh, I've been a minister for 14 months, and uh, I've been uh, uh, trying to change the narrative on the sector. So rather than um, just take it as, uh, you know, some jobs here and there and so forth, no, I want, I want everyone to realize that it is an important export. Uh, when you look at tourism globally, it represents 10% uh, of global GDP. One in every 10 jobs comes from tourism. One in every five new jobs is in tourism. Um, it, uh, the, the SDGs, the 17 SDGs, SDGs are in the heart of that sector, promoting prosperity, peace, conserving uh, heritage sites, uh, empowering uh, gender equality. All of these issues come very much in the heart uh, of the sector. In Egypt, uh, uh, we've launched the E-TRIP. E-TRIP is the Egypt Tourism Reform Program, and the idea is collectively to have people uh, saying the same uh, vision, acting upon it, whether it's the government, the parliament, the private sector, which uh, represents 98% of, uh, of tourism. Uh, and the overarching objective for us is that every household have at least one person working in the sector. So this is something that uh, we are implementing. There's a lot of political will behind it. And um, uh, when it comes to women, uh, in the E-TRIP, there's a whole section, a pillar of reform called Global International Trends, and in there, we have green tourism, women empowerment, and digitalization and innovation. And there, therefore, what's being discussed here in the forum with startups, the idea of how you bring this future into a sector that has a lot of history is, is key. For women and women in Egypt, uh, we have the National Council for Women, and um, it's taking a more proactive role. On many of the statistics that are uh, published by the WEF, we don't score very well. We're very mindful of that. And uh, the government has been taking uh, a top-bottom as well as a bottom-up approach. Uh, currently, uh, we are eight female ministers uh, in cabinet. Uh, I'm the first female minister of tourism, uh, which is a very male-dominated uh, sector. Uh, we have 15% uh, of women in parliament, 44% uh, of women in the public sector. However, uh, our objectives are much more, and we want to increase that to 30% in cabinet, 30% in parliament. Uh, there is, for the first time, a national observatory to basically monitor the progress and look after those KPIs. Uh, there's, uh, for the first time, a national uh, uh, strategy for women empowerment, uh, which is done at a national level, making sure that uh, women get uh, into uh, leadership courses, mm. There's a mentoring program leading by example. In tourism, uh, in, the, in the pillar related to women, 
there's a minimum number of women that are required uh, for uh, courses to be filled in. Uh, there are workshops on harassment, making sure that the working place, whether in hotels or in companies, are also quite decent and conducive for participation. So there's a, there's a lot of effort that's taking place, and what is very uh, encouraging uh, is that globally the sector is doing well, uh, mobilizing uh, people within the country to actually uh, uh, see the importance of, of, of the sector, not just as a livelihood, but also as uh, a, national, uh, a national stamp. One thing I will conclude with, because it also comes with this idea of uh, uh, the old and the new, we have the Grand Egyptian Museum, the GEM, it's opening up at the end of 2020, and our branding is the GEM 2020. It's fascinating that you see uh, a, mon you know, a, a museum which includes 100,000 pieces, uh, which is the only museum dedicated to one civilization. It will have the full collection of Tutankhamun, 5,000 5, pieces. Many of you might have seen artifacts in different museums, but this is the only museum where you can see the collection and take a selfie with the pyramids. It's on the plateau of the pyramids, and it's very contemporary from the outside. So again, the idea is you can have history, you can have legacy, but at the same time, you would be able to showcase it and, and use technology and use innovation uh, and, and basically be able to discuss and implement a lot of what the forum stands for. Thank you. Noor. Um, I mentioned that uh, um, the Global Shapers community focused a lot on the environment here. That was the meeting just before this summit. You're part of the Global Shapers community. You are a Jordanian living in Amman. As a Jordanian living in Amman, why is it important to you to work on environmental stewardship um, as a priority? Great. Thank you, Merrick. Um, first of all, as context, um, we at the Shapers community host regional uh, gatherings for Shapers every year. So we have seven, um, and the Amman Hub just hosted the uh, Sh uh, Shape Mina Summit last week. Uh, our focus was on climate change, and it was mainly because we keep hearing a lot about how climate change and environmental issues are crucial. Uh, but for us in the region, given the situation and context, we feel like there are a lot of challenges we should tackle first. Um, so for the Amman Hub and our fellow shapers, we felt that it is worth to explore. Uh, is it actually an issue we should be thinking about right now, given our situation? Um, so we actually put together a, an, an experiential program that um, made us, uh, allowed us to talk to experts, lo local experts on the issue, and also visit um, areas in Jordan that has firsthand witnessed the effect of climate change. Um, so for instance, we went to Azraq, which is a town in northern Jordan, um, that uh, has its resources almost completely depleted, uh, especially its water resources. Um, and we, then we were allowed to see that it has actually affected the local community, um, whether it's uh, the women who work there, the education prospects, the environment and the bird migration, given uh, that Azraq is actually a focal point for bird migration. Um, so when we were reflecting afterwards, especially uh, in these few days, uh, we noticed that, you know what, it is an important topic that should be brought onto the forefront. Um, and we do not know enough about it, so at least we should be taking the simple steps of um, maybe learning more about it now so we can act uh, faster than we should. So just bringing the topic onto the forefront, given the other challenges that we have, but including that amongst them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob, um, you're an evangelical pastor living in Dallas, and I learned from you that uh, you've been to many places around the world. You travel a lot. Among them, you've been to Gaza, you've been to Iran. How come that uh, an evan evangelical pastor based in Dallas makes the effort and travels to Iran, to Gaza? How come? So I would just say I am a real live evangelical Baptist pastor. I'm just happy. Uh, so don't hold it against me. It's, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you for the invitation to get to be here, to be a part of this forum. I would say for me, uh, the people that I feared the most have become the people that I love the most. And the truth of the matter is I'm the most unlikely person on the face of the earth to be doing what I do. I grew up deep East Texas, that wouldn't mean a lot for many of you, uh, but very conservative. I was uh, radicalized as a Baptist early on and uh, extremist and so forth. 
And so I had a worldview that was very uh, narrow, if you will. And uh, my wife and I always wanted to be missionaries. But there were some reasons it didn't work out because of some health challenges that she had. But it was in God's plan. Uh, and I stumbled into the world, and it changed me. And, and here's what happened in a nutshell. Our church wanted to do something to serve in the world, and so we focused on Vietnam. So working with uh, communists from Vietnam, growing up in a country that had been at war with Vietnam, that wasn't a likely place to go. Uh, you can't preach and do what evangelicals do normally in uh, Vietnam, but I discovered that if we wanted to go in and serve the people, uh, they wanted us. And so it's a long story, but whatever your job was is what we mobilized you to do in Vietnam. So our bankers did uh, projects for water buffaloes, and our, but it wasn't enough just for our fluent people. Our lawn people began to build corrals for the water buffalo and teach the Vietnamese how to do that. So there's about, I don't know, few hundred projects we did, invested a few million dollars. My wife, I'm real proud of her this year. She finishes up working with the Vietnamese for 15 years, uh, their special education program and curriculum. And so whatever your job was, you served. So what I've learned from this forum is we need to collaborate together because the truth of the matter is churches, mosques, and synagogues are filled with hundreds and thousands of people that want to make a difference in the world. But guess what? They don't want to be missionaries. They don't want to preach. They just want to go serve people. And so that's been good for, for us to experience. Uh, last year, uh, Vietnamese, Vietnam gave us the Friendship Medal, which is the highest award anyone can get in Vietnam. Can't brag about it at home. I'm from Texas, and I'm a Baptist, so it doesn't go over real big there. But I'll tell you guys about it, and uh, hopefully you'll be happy. So the, the first thing I would say learning from this is we need to collaborate together. Here's the second thing I would say is uh, we need to move beyond conversation. I heard that here. Uh, when Dr. Schwab gets up and he talked about just don't, don't talk about things, have a plan. And so the second group of people that I began to work with that uh, scared me more than the communists were the Muslims. And after 9-11, I was invited to go to Afghanistan and work. And I did. I wish I had time to tell you the story. I don't. But uh, through a fluke, I became friends with uh, one of the warlords. And so through him, we began to connect young Baptist pastors uh, with imams. And we built schools and clinics and all kind of things together. And about that time, I got to know a man named Oliver McTurnan, and he began to mentor me about how to relate to Muslims and, and many others a, as well. But here's what I learned from, from working uh, with Muslims. Three things. I'm an evangelical, and evangelicals don't go to interfaith meetings because we believe there's only one way to heaven. And we also believe that if we go to that and people disagree with us, they view us as bigots. Who wants to go be viewed as a bigot? So we don't go. But I realized as I was becoming friends with communists and, 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 and Vietnamese and Muslims and Afghans, there had to be a way to connect. And so we changed the language. So I don't talk about interfaith because no evangelical is going to go to an interfaith event. I talk about multi-faith. You don't have to give your faith up, but it's good to be friends with people. Jesus liked most people, so why don't we reach out to them? So that was a big thing for us. I would say another shift was moving from information to relationship. And I know that some of you guys may really disagree with me on this, especially those of you that are social scientists. I don't think the problem is information. There, there's so many things written to our own tribes about getting along. I think the problem is we don't know people in the other tribe. That's what changed me. I became friends with Muslims, and I thought, these people are not who I've been told they are. And, and our church, we began to expose our church. We lost a few hundred members, but literally, we began to invite Muslims to come to our church. In Texas, we have this very famous barbecue, so we bought a bunch of beef ribs, and we barbecued it Texas-style with an imam there to make sure everything was fine, and we served it halal. We expected a couple of hundred. We had a couple of thousand Muslims show up for that. Well, what happened in our church and in the community was people became friends with Muslims, and, and that, that was the game changer. Now... They're looking at different sources from where they get their information from. And so from that, I wish I had time to talk to you about it, but uh, me and Imam Majid, one of the leading imams in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, started these pastor imam retreats, believe it or not, in uh, Pakistan. It, we, we lived, and it went over really good. And then we started them in America. 
And we've now had 15 of those. Our goal is 50. It's impacted over 200 congregations and half a million people just in the last 18 months. We've run out of money and everything else. But we're praying because we believe in faith. And, and I would also say what happens is, especially in the faith community, we've got to move our faith community from tribalism to becoming global citizens. And there's a way to use your faith to do that. Faith does not have to be counter to citizenship. Uh, and here's a, So I would say we need to start collaborating, everything I've heard. I would also say uh, we need to move beyond conversation. But I would also say something else. I would say we, all of us, really need to be converted. Every single one of us. Now, I know I'm evangelical. I want everybody to believe in Jesus, and I'll baptize all of you. I was excited King Abdullah has built the baptistry site. You've heard of John the Baptist? Well, I'm Bob the Baptist. I want to use that thing. I mean, I'm really excited about it. But here's what I would say. I think inside of ourselves, we've got to be converted about how we see other people. And we're going to do that as we become friends with them, as we relate to them. And so the challenge is this. We all know we're supposed to love God, so let's love him, whatever your faith is. Uh, we all know that we're supposed to love one another. That's not a debate. But if we do what Jesus said, I mean, Easter's coming up. What does he do? He gives his life for the world. Well, I think that we have to be willing to love our enemies. And when Jesus said, love your enemies, he was being counterintuitive because you cannot love someone and be their enemy. It's just impossible. And so I would say what's critical for us, if we're going to be different, we've got to see the image of God in one another. And when I look at the image of God, I, I can't hate, I can't fear. And so when they're upset with me, instead of me saying, well, you're wrong, my first question has become, well, what needs to change about Bob? And that's why. Thank you. Adel, uh, you're the founder of a company startup that was selected among the 100. First, tell us about your company. Well, thank you, Mike, very much. Um, I'm the CEO of the company. I'm not the founder, just a small correction. Um, if you allow, I'm going to wear it while I describe it. So Amal Glass is a wearable for the blind and visually impaired. We use artificial intelligence and machine learning to make their lives easy, doing a group of things all the way from simple stuff, telling them date, time, and weather, moving on to color detection, GPS location, all the way to cool stuff like reading to them in Arabic, in English, detecting currency, and we're experimenting with environment as well, environmental detection. That's what we do. <laughs> so we were here two years ago. We had another group of 100 startups here. So when we thought about what is the difference this year, the difference is really around the um, ecosystem. So you as a, as a startup leader, CEO, um, for you, what does it take? How can we make sure uh, that uh, if we are here two years uh, from today, uh, there's been meaningful progress made so that people like you, they, uh, they succeed thanks to the circumstances around them, that we strengthen the bonds between the universities, the VCs, the ministers, uh, the bankers, and people like you. Uh, so what, what would it be for you coming from your vantage point? Well, I mean, I look at that in three dimensions and look at what has it, mean, has it meant for me being here for the last couple of days and how to build on that. Um, on three dimensions, first of all, on the diversity of people that are here all the way looking at their experiences, where they come from, nationalities, uh, professionals in private public sectors, um, being very generous on their experience, their time, and their connections as well, and making sure to build on that so that we have some measurable outcomes as we come out of here, to, to your point, uh, and moving forward. So that's one dimension. The second dimension is getting closely in touch with decision makers who are under the roof for the past two days. Again, very generous in terms of being willing to help, being willing to take the next step, connect us, um, listen for what we have to say, and actually act upon it. And last but hardly least is being among uh, entrepreneurs who are very passionate, who are well accomplished, who are like-minded people who are willing to share their passion, their knowledge, their contacts. Now, grouping all three dimensions together, I think getting something measurable out of it is not as easy. I think each one needs to do it individually. 
Um, and I was just talking to a fellow and saying that I need to digest what happened for the last two days uh, for a couple of hours or maybe a day to come up with clearly what needs to happen in the next phase be before we go on to my day-to-day -day operational uh, startup. Thank you. And I'll do a quick round of follow-up. So I'll start with you, Adel. Um, the, um, if you look at the group of 100 this year, you could say about 20% of them actually are social entrepreneurs or are impacting society as a whole. Your company uh, is helping blind and visually impaired. Um, how would you explain that? We didn't see that in the group uh, two years ago as much. Is it a, is it a trend? Is it an accident? Um, and how do uh, you think? How do uh, uh, startups see their role in society? Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a great question, actually. So I think we are in a part of the world where you have, we have so many problems. Many of them are affecting our day-to-day. -day. Whether we like it or not, whether we brand it or not, we are solving social problems. Because we have so many of them, we face them every single day. It is not a luxury anymore. Uh, Her Excellency the Minister referred to the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. We're living it every day. It's our reality. It is not um, a luxury and nice to have for us to solve those problems. So the way I'm seeing it, we're going after the problems that we have, and they just happen to be social because that's our reality. Bob, um, you in one of the conversations that I've been privy to, you said that um, we should move from interfaith to multi-faith, but also you said something around really being practical around the impact of, of religious leaders or representatives of different faith. So yes, there is the spiritual dimension, but what do you think are some practical ways in which uh, religious leaders, people of multiple faith, leaders of multiple faith can actually uh, move the needle on some of the societal issues? In what ways do you think? Well, let me just give you one example right now. Imam Majid uh, has a little mosque of 30,000 in DC. David Saperstein was the previous ambassador for religious freedom, he's a friend. And uh, together, we three have been to uh, uh, Cox's Bazaar uh, with the Rohingya refugees. We've brought attention to that. Uh, we've met with top leaders in our country about that. And in addition, what we're now doing, we're mobilizing Christians, Muslims, and Jews that are doctors and educators to go together. Now, in an evangelical perspective, because we're, we're a little bit isolationist, we would never think about doing humanitarian work together. We're gonna to do our Christian stuff and you do your Muslim stuff and your Jewish stuff. I think the people of faith have yet begun to dream about what is possible if we hold on to our faith and at the same time learn to work with one another, people of different faith. I say all the time, just disagree. But don't be mean, don't be hateful. What's, what's the point of that? Show the value of your faith by the value you bring to the community. And if the only value your faith is bringing is just to yourself and to your tribe, what, what kind of faith is that? Shouldn't your faith be a blessing to people outside your tribe? So I think humanitarian opportunity, I think uh, economic opportunity, I, I mean, the sky's the limit for what could happen there. Thank you. Noor, um, I also view you as the representative of, of Jordan on the panel here. And you know, we've been trying to make that connection between Jordan and the world over the past uh, two days here. Um, what would be, if you were the ambassador of Jordan to the world, what is it that you would wanna communicate to the international community uh, about Jordan? What would be the main things you would want them uh, to know about uh, Jordan? Okay, that's a lot of pressure. Thank you, Merck. Um, I think first and foremost is that um, there is a lot of potential and a lot of talent and will, um, if I may. Um, I speak on behalf of uh, the youth at least because that's where most of my interactions are. But I know we're very open and happy to collaborate uh, and to listen to the other side and see how we can together reach um, solutions to the challenges we're facing. So. That would be it, I think, uh, the, the ability and will to collaborate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Rania, um, Egypt, um, huge economy in the region. You have uh, uh, undertaken a lot of reforms over the past few years. Impressive, congratulations. Um, 
are you optimistic about uh, about uh, the course right now? What are the things we should watch out, particularly when it comes to the economy of Egypt uh, in the years to come? Um, uh, Egypt uh, took very bold reforms in uh, 2016, and uh, really the champion of those reforms have been the Egyptian people, who uh, put uh, the country first and really, uh, you know, uh, withstood uh, a lot of the uh, fallout of these tough decisions. I think that um, uh, the, the growth rate for Egypt has been higher than the regional averages and we're doing pretty well. There are still uh, a reform agenda which is uh, very ambitious. Um, monetary policy, fiscal policy is underway. Structural reforms are what we are working on, whether it's in the civil service, uh, whether it's on different sectors. Even when I uh, took over tourism, trying to approach it from a structural mm. aspect so that you have sustainability in everything you do. You don't want to be uh, doing uh, reforms that uh, are very short-lived. You want them to have a longer impact, and to do that, it requires some heavy lifting. Um, I, I'm a believer in policy frameworks, and uh, policy frameworks need to be uh, transparent and communicated, and that's something that I'm trying to do in the sector. Just in terms of um, something that comes out of, uh, of what we've been discussing the past two days, in the region we have uh, leaders and laggards when it comes to uh, innovation technology, some of the themes that have been uh, discussed. We have uh, a very uh, impressive uh, group of young leaders who are taking policy positions in their countries. Uh, and I believe that uh, uh, there is a platform uh, for us to come together uh, through the WEF to basically see how uh, different experiences in different countries can be copied elsewhere. Uh, there's, there's a wealth of shared experience. There's a wealth uh, of will and commitment. And I think we, we, we have a chance to capitalize on that and push it forward. Thank you very much. Alain, um, I'm, I don't think I'm, you, you are from Lebanon originally. Um, you live in uh, Dubai. Uh, what we had here at the heart of our conversation as well is how do we help with uh, reconstruction and stabilization of certain economies? Of course, top of mind are economies like Iraq, top of mind is what's happening in Syria. What do you think is the role of the private sector in all that? Does it, is there a role for the private sector? Well, definitely, because in reality, governments may fund, but the private sector is going to build. So reconstruction, I think, has been looked at uh, in a truncated way in the past because it has been about providing aid, being it aid packages or, or different type of aids, and actually rebuilding the physical infrastructure. But I think what these countries will need the most, or need the most, is actually rebuild their economies, rebuild their legal framework, rebuild their judicial system, rebuild their education system, make sure that they can actually be part of the world that they have missed for the past, uh, for the past number of years. So actually, you have a generation gap there. You know, when you talk about the refugees, I mean, the average lifetime of a refugee is 17 years. I'm not sure if people actually, even people in the room know that. A refugee, on average, be, stays a refugee for 17 years. Mm. That's a lot. Now, there is a lot of work that's happening in order to support these things and to alleviate the burden of uh, refugees out of countries like Lebanon, like Jordan, uh, Turkey, and so on. The, these are the three countries around Syria that have paid the most, that have been the most generous in, from that standpoint. But the reality is the private sector has a long way to go in actually making sure that it's engaged and actually bringing solutions. But at the end of the day, the private sector is reasonable and has to see an opportunity, and that opportunity cannot come despite, I would say, uh, the lack of frameworks. So the importance of putting on framework will enable the private sector, and then the private sector has to be there and actually be open to take risk and also to reap the fruits of that in the future. Because we should not forget that the private sector role is to actually drive economic growth create sustainable job employments and actually make money. And we should encourage the private sector to make money so they reinvest more in these economies and they continue to grow them. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this panorama view of, I think, what, what we've been looking at here uh, at the World Economic Forum over the past two days. But I think it's uh, a quite a nice uh, 360 of uh, the agenda for the region. I talked at the beginning about uh, not only thinking, but also having some action items, something to do uh, as a result of this summit. So I'd like to just get a few quick reactions from each of you on what it would be the one thing or more things that you would do um, out of this summit, as a result of this summit. 
Uh, if I could start with you, Alan. Well, I would say two things. One is I'm going to go back running to Dubai in order to work with on the circular economy with the fourth with the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, with Murat and the team, and see how we can contribute into that. So that's number one. Number two, I'm going to be also doubling down on this idea of actually putting forward an economic vision for the region that should empower the region to actually double or triple its GDP. Thank you. Um, in the uh, spirit of uh, partnerships and collaboration, the idea of having the uh, policymakers who are um, uh, with the exposure of what the forum stands for get together and try and put an action plan of how we can basically create synergies and, and leverage and build on the experiences that we have. Thank you. No. Okay. Um, I think for us now that we realize the importance and the urgency of the climate uh, change issue, I will work to make the conversation more relevant for the youth in the region about how we can um, tackle this issue. Thank you. Uh, Vietnam taught me how to think about cities and how the world works and, and that sort of thing. Working with Muslims taught me how to think about faith. How do you talk about that? From being here, uh, some things, a lot of personal notes I've made is in terms of meshing those two, where both the society and the faith, how do we do that? And what I'm going to do in the, the retreats that we're doing in the U.S. and around the world, how do we push that farther and more? Thank you. Ada? Um, well, two things. First of all, I'm going to go back to my team with tons of new ideas, thoughts, and insightful conversation outcomes, and just brainstorm on what to do next. Um, on the second front, um, I'm going to connect or reconnect with a lot of people um, that have touched base during the past two days on collaborations, potential working together, help, and support. Thank you. So what is the World Economic Forum going to do? Well, I can tell you a lot um, in the region. As I said at the beginning, uh, we've been present in the region since the 1970s. I mentioned some of the initiatives that we have announced here. Uh, Alan mentioned that he's going to go back and work on the circular economy. We are already at work at the Dubai Future Foundation uh, on the fourth industrial revolution and will be opening up new activities you will see soon in other countries um, of the region. So the fourth industrial revolution is gonna be a big thing for the World Economic Forum uh, in this region. But we will also keep working on reskilling young people for jobs. This is another thing that we've been um, hard at work over the past few years. So we'll continue that. In a nutshell, what we will do, we will uh, continue being committed uh, to the Middle East and North Africa through engaging you, our multi-stakeholder community. So, with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming, not only for coming, but also engaging in the dialogue. And uh, you've uh, uh, become part of uh, a community or communities, and uh, we really look forward to working with you in the months and years ahead. So thank you very much. And this closes um, this summit at the Dead Sea. Thank you. <laughs>